Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our next lesson. We're going to talk about pigments, the nature of light, and a little bit about the evolution of uh, photosynthesis as a process. So... First, let's talk very quickly about pigments. Pigments are molecules that absorb light energy at a certain wavelength. Um, they are what give objects color, um, and pigments are what absorb light during photosynthesis. So, um, the main pigments that tend to be used in um, photosynthetic organisms are chlorophylls and carotenoids. In plants, which uh, tend to be the focus of a lot of studies of photosynthesis, um, the most common forms of chlorophyll are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. So what you see here is a molecule of chlorophyll, and it's pointing out the fact that for chlorophyll A, this is a methyl group, and for uh, chlorophyll B, there's a CHO group there. Uh, just that one small difference does make a, a change to the wavelengths of light that the molecule absorbs. So chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B absorb different wavelengths of light. Um, you also have bacterial chlorophyll found in purple and green sulfur bacteria. Um, cyanobacteria have chlorophyll A, they have certain yellow carotenoids, and they also have uh, this uh, molecule right here, Phyco, phycocillin, sorry, no, phycobilin. I always get that word mixed up. So here we see two different phycobilins. One of them is kind of a, a reddish color and the other is more of a cyan color. Um, and so basically some small structural differences can change the colors that these uh, molecules absorb and therefore change the color they appear. Uh, this is just showing you various carotenoids and their colors. Carotenoids were uh, named for the fact that they're found in carrots. So they give carrots their orange. They're also responsible for uh, the colors of leaves in the fall. In the fall, the chlorophyll in leaves tends to break down, leaving behind the red, yellow, and orange carotenoids, which is why you tend to see all the pretty colors in the fall. So let's take a look at what gives an object color. So here we have a viewer, that's the eyeball. We have a source of light, that's the sun. And we have an object that appears to us, the viewer, as green. So light contains all the different colors of the visible light spectrum, which you can uh, think of as Roy G. Biv. Uh, Roy G. Biv stands for uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And those are the colors that make up the spectrum of visible light. So let's take a look at what happens when each of these different light colors hits this object. So red light hits the object and it's absorbed. Yellow light hits the object and it's also absorbed. Green light hits the object but is not absorbed. Instead, it's reflected. So if you are an observer viewing this, um, viewing this object, the green light that it reflects goes to your eyes and your eyes pick up that signal as, ah, this is green. Meanwhile, the other colors, blue and uh, purple, here representing violet, are all absorbed. So an object that is green absorbs all wavelengths of light except green which means that anything that's green is going to absorb red, yellow, it'll absorb orange light, it'll absorb blue, indigo, and violet. What that means is something that's green like chloroplasts or chlorophyll is going to absorb all light except green light. And when this is important is because if a chlorophyll molecule is absorbing light energy, but it does not absorb green light, in theory, if you shine a green light on a plant, it should not be able to photosynthesize because most of the energy that's coming in cannot be absorbed by the plant because most of the pigment molecules are chlorophyll. If there are some carotenoids in there or some other pigment molecules, then maybe the plant can perform a little photosynthesis with that green light. So let's look at how we kind of measure, uh, measure colors. So there are two major 
pieces of equipment you can use. One is a spectrophotometer, which basically just measures how much of certain wavelengths of light is being absorbed. So what you see is you have a source of white light, and then you have some sort of refracting prism that's going to split light into its constituent colors. You have a barrier that is basically going to only allow certain wavelengths of light to pass through. So up here on the top image, it is set to allow green light to pass through. Green light is shined on here, a chlorophyll solution, and you'll see all of the green light that goes in comes out. You have what's called a photoelectric tube, which is basically there as a light sensor, and it's gonna measure how much light is coming through. So what this is showing is that green light is not absorbed by this chlorophyll solution. Instead, the green light mostly passes through. However, if you switch to a different color in the spectrum, such as blue light, and you allow that to shine through the chlorophyll solution, you'll see here that very little of that blue light is going to make it through the chlorophyll. Since very little light is transmitted, that means most of that light is absorbed. So chlorophyll happens to be very effective at absorbing blue light. You can also measure the absorbance with a colorimeter um, just to look at uh, kind of um, another schematic of how this works. You have a colored solution. In this case, it's blue. Um, you have incoming light at a certain wavelength. I've made it indigo, so it's uh, about 400 nanometer wavelength light. You don't really need to know details about wavelength, except just that wavelengths of light are associated with different colors. In general, the longer the wavelength, so the larger the number there, the redder or the more towards the red end of the spectrum, the color will be, and the smaller the number uh, before nanometers, the more towards the violet end of the spectrum it'll be. So we have coming into this a solution, 100% of your light intensity of that only 20% passes through the colored solution. So 20% can make it through the colored solution and hit the light sensor. So we can say that 80% of the light is absorbed since only 20% is making it through. We can use this absorbance information at different wavelengths to create something called an absorption spectrum. Spectrum is singular, spectra is the plural. So what this, uh, what you can create this for is any pigment, anything that absorbs color. So what we see here are the absorption spectra of three different pigments, one a carotenoid, one chlorophyll A, and one chlorophyll B. What you'll see, and there's a diagram showing the wavelength of light here at the bottom, you do have this image on your paper, however you do not have a colored image. If you want to color it so that you can see it a little better, feel free to do so. So the chlorophylls both reflect a lot of green light and their color is reflected in the color of the um, line for each graph. So chlorophyll A has a peak absorbance, meaning it absorbs most of its light around here, so maybe around 425 nanometers, and it has another peak of absorbance around here, maybe around 675 nanometers. So chlorophyll A um, is going to absorb light most when you have blue light and kind of orange light. Chlorophyll B has slightly different peaks of absorbance. So for example, it will absorb really well around 500 nanometers. And it's got a second peak around, let's say, um, 640-ish nanometers. It's just an approximation. So if you have a plant that has both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B pigment molecules, it gives it a slightly wider spectrum of absorption so it can absorb more wavelengths of light. Then you throw in another molecule like a carotenoid, which remember is going to reflect orange light mostly at us. Its peak absorption is at maybe four, let's say 480 or so. And so it is when you have that carotenoid present, you now have another molecule, a different molecule that can absorb a different wavelength of light, meaning you're expanding the, the, uh, the portion of the visible light spectrum that your plant can absorb. You can use this to create what's called an action spectrum. So an action spectrum is not for an individual pigment, it's instead for an organism. So it's showing the rate of photosynthesis for an organism at different wavelengths of light. If you look, the wavelength that 
um, has the lowest rate of photosynthesis is going to reflect the wavelength of light that is absorbed the least, um, which is in the green area. So that means that this photosynthetic organism, whatever it is, probably looks green. So this could be a plant that has um, chlorophyll A, has chlorophyll B, um, has uh, carotenoids as well. So you see you've expanded the um, portion of the visible light spectrum you can use to perform photosynthesis. So there are accessory pigments. They do a couple of jobs. Some of them allow plants to absorb more wavelengths of light than they could if they just used chlorophyll. There are um, other organisms, uh, lots of bacteria, a few protists that use other pigments as their primary uh, pigment to absorb light during photosynthesis. There are also, there's another function for these accessory pigments though, which is photoprotection. So some of these pigments will absorb extra solar energy as it's coming in and release it as heat. This is important because if you have very high intensity light coming in and it hits the molecules that are absorbing light in photosynthesis, if you have that hitting a, a pigment molecule or uh, what are called reaction centers, um, they can actually do physical damage to the molecules. So instead, you have these accessory pigments absorbing a little of that light, keeping it from hitting the actual photosynthesis equipment, and then just kind of releasing that as heat. Therefore, it's not able to damage um, the photosynthetic um, organelles, the photosynthetic molecules. If that happened, then a plant or other photosynthesizing organism, if it can't perform photosynthesis, it can't feed itself and it will die. So that's a very useful adaptation. So how are pigments used in photosynthesis? Well, they're arranged into these complexes of pigments plus proteins called a reaction center. As light hits the pigment, the electrons in that molecule are going to absorb light energy. And when they absorb light energy, we're going to say they become excited. So that is um, an electron that has extra energy. If there is nothing nearby to accept that electron or to transfer its energy to, usually that electron will then release some light. We'll look at that on another slide. So um, we'll actually look at that more when we talk about photosynthesis in our next lesson. Apologies. So let's look at where photosynthesis came from. Um, the first organisms were not photosynthetic. They were most likely heterotrophs, meaning that they took in their food from outside sources. So they probably broke down either inorganic molecules or very simple organic molecules that formed in nature um, and used those for energy. They were also anaerobic, meaning that they did not use oxygen. In fact, for most of the organisms that first existed on the planet, oxygen was most likely toxic. And we know that because we have evidence that the early atmosphere contained very little free oxygen. <clears throat> so you can actually uh, measure or even infer the amount of oxygen that is in the ancient atmosphere by looking at rocks of various ages. So I believe the, er the oldest rocks we've discovered are about four, four and a half billion years old. Um, I think a lot of them actually tend to be found in Australia. Um, and if you look at the composition of those rocks, there are some materials, some rock types that can only form under low oxygen concentrations. And you'll find those rocks from um, the oldest rocks that we found all the way up until starting around two 2.4 billion years ago, at which point you start seeing less and less of these materials that need low oxygen conditions to exist, and you start seeing materials that can only form under higher oxygen conditions. So this is linked to um, a rise in oxygen concentration, and that rise in oxygen concentration has increased until we're about, I believe it's about 18% of our atmosphere is oxygen now. Um, there was a relatively rapid rise in oxygen concentration around 2.4 billion years ago, and that actually is sometimes called the oxygen catastrophe because at that point, most life on the planet was wiped out, or most species on the planet were wiped out. And only some hardy species of bacteria of unicellular life that were able to tolerate oxygen, as well as any oxygen-producing photosynthesizers, were able to survive this catastrophe. So 
when the levels of oxygen start rising, that is when we posit that oxygen generating photosynthesis had to have evolved. Now, oxygen generating photosynthesis is not the only type of photosynthesis. There are types of photosynthesis performed by various bacteria that use something, some molecule besides oxygen. Um, that generates something besides oxygen. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about where oxygen is important in photosynthesis, why it's needed, and what some of the alternatives are in our next lesson. Um, and then as time passed, as more organisms were performing photosynthesis and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere, we had higher concentrations of oxygen. So, the first oxygen-producing photosynthetic organisms were likely cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are named that because they are cyan-colored. Cyan means blue-green, so they're sometimes also called blue-green bacteria. They are of particular interest to us because they appear to be the ancestors of modern chloroplasts. And we'll talk in a moment about how chloroplasts originated. So, these prokaryotes that were performing photosynthesis were responsible for oxygenating the atmosphere, which was a very important step in evolution because oxygen-powered cell respiration can produce a lot more energy than anaerobic respiration. And so, with uh, the release of oxygen into the atmosphere, organisms could begin to use oxygen during cellular respiration, get more energy per molecule of glucose, and were then able to use that energy to, to gain complexity, to perform more reactions, and so on. Um, and Evidence of cyanobacteria in the fossil record also coincides with this timing of around 2.4 billion years ago when there was a rapid rise in oxygen levels. So the first organisms to perform photosynthesis were bacteria, obviously, because until about a billion and a half years ago, there weren't any eukaryotes. Um, so the first photosynthesizers um, had a variety of methods to perform photosynthesis. Uh, they produced different waste products besides just oxygen. Um, and remember, prokaryotes don't have any membrane-bound organelles inside. So instead of having separate chloroplasts inside of them, what they had were basically these infoldings of their cell membrane. They would have the molecules that perform a photosynthesis, um, electron transport chains, ATP synthase, all of those good things would be found in these infoldings of the membrane. So what you see in uh, part B of the figure on the bottom is some of these infoldings in a cyanobacterium. And in cyanobacteria, these infoldings are called thylakoids, which can get confusing because we're going to have structures called thylakoids that are important in chloroplasts. So um, you see these kind of infoldings that are performing photosynthesis um, in prokaryotes and gradually um, these infoldings may have pinched off. So here you see a kind of cleaved thylakoid membrane, it says, um, and those may have pinched off, for example, here to then form just an enclosed structure that's a thylakoid. So let's take a look at chloroplasts and how they developed. So some ancestral eukaryote, which already had mitochondria, mitochondria in it, endocytosed or took in a cyanobacterium which is this guy up here. They're calling it an endosymbiont. Endo means inside. Symbiont means like um, a symbiont is a being that lives um, sometimes within and definitely in a strong relationship with another organism. They are in a symbiotic relationship. So instead of being digested, uh, this cyanobacterium was instead kept alive inside of the eukaryotic cell um, where it was able to produce not only enough sugar, enough glucose to power itself, it had made extra sugar, which could then be used by the eukaryotic cell that was hosting it. Over time, um, the chloroplasts lost the ability to live independently. They lost genes that weren't really involved in photosynthesis. And a lot of those functions like protein synthesis and you know gene storage got taken over by the nucleus of these uh, eukaryotic cells. Um, after, you know, um, billion, billion and a half years of evolution, um, chloroplasts have now become uh, organelles that are 
uh, dependent on the rest of the cell in order to survive, and plant cells are dependent on their chloroplast to survive as well. When we talk about DNA, we'll talk about more of the evidence for this endosymbiotic theory, um, especially the fact that um, mitochondria, which arose through endosymbiosis, a separate endosymbiosis event, and chloroplasts have their own DNA. They are double membraned. And another thing is the DNA of chloroplasts and mitochondria have been sequenced and compared to the gene sequences of bacteria. And we've actually found the closest living relatives of the organism that gave rise to modern chloroplasts, as well as the one that gave rise to modern, modern mitochondria. So we'll take a look at that more when we talk about um, evolution next semester. So just a brief timeline of the evolution of photosynthesis. So the first Structures that seem to be um, indicative of photosynthetic bacteria appear in the fossil record about 3.4 billion years ago. No, they're not fossilized cells. They're something called stromolites, um, which are structures that are formed by Basically, they're like mats of bacteria. So they're fossilized stromolites. Um, and they're also these filamentous bacteria, which basically um, link together in a chain and that's how they live, just stuck to each other, and they form these long filaments. Um, so fossils that indicate the existence of these things have been found as far back as 3.4 billion years ago. Um, cyanobacteria had to evolve before oxygen started accumulating in the atmosphere um, because they had to exist before they could start pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. So the estimate is that about 2.7 billion years ago, the first cyanobacteria evolved. Um, we start seeing evidence 2.4 to 2.3 billion years ago that oxygen levels were rising in, um, in the atmosphere. About 1.2 billion years ago, you have red and brown algae which are eukaryotes, um, appear in the fossil record, forming more complex structures than single-celled bacteria. Um, green algae start to outcompete red and brown algae in shallow water, um, which was about 750 million years ago. Um, over the next 300 million years, seems like green algae uh, ended up developing multicellular structures which were then the ancestors of modern plants. So plants that live on land first appear around 475 million years ago, and then vascular plants, plants that have um, basically vessels that can carry water and nutrients around in them, evolved around 423 million years ago, and that really allowed plants to kind of explode in diversity because they were able to grow much taller um, and able to take over more areas of habitat. So that was our lesson on pigments and light as well as how uh, photosynthesis first evolved. Next lesson is the actual process of photosynthesis itself.